All right, human beings of the internet, welcome back to MissprintCon 2019 live streaming from Comic Town in Columbus, Ohio. I am here with my next guest, Ryan Rooks. He is the author of A Collector's History of Magic the Gathering, and he is gonna go really in depth on a bunch of different kinds of misprints. So I hope you enjoy, and here he is. Thank you so much. Uh, so not too in depth, I've got about an hour to talk, but I'm gonna go through the uh, print production for the way that magic cards are made, and then talk about how different misprints happen uh, during this process. So I've got up on screen right now, is a um, this is a cutaway of a Heidelberg press. Now th this is simplified. There's only one color in the press that's being depicted, but uh, it's the same thing for a four color press. What you have here is the press feed. This is where all of the the stacks of blank sheets go, um, and those actually have a suction cup that picks it up and advances it um, onto this roller and into the registration system. Uh, and this is what aligns the sheets and makes sure that they're all oriented correctly. And then up here, we have the ink fountain, is, which is where the ink is fed. And there's this whole complex series of rollers that I'm going to uh, blow past just by saying that um, they, they move and vibrate back and forth and do all these crazy things to try and get the ink into a uniform layer across the entire width of these cylinders. Um, and there's all of these cylinders that just uh, go, it goes through to make it all uniform. Uh, and then on the other side, there's a water feeder that also feeds through um, and then wets the plate. And we've got the plate cylinder here. So this is where the printing plate for the, the magic cards goes is wrapped around this cylinder. And I'll, I'll have a better example of that in a moment. And what happens is that the water uh, gets on this plate and adheres to the part where there's not supposed to be ink. Uh, and then it goes through the, the ink and that gets laid down and it's repelled by the water and only adheres to the other parts. And then that comes down here and is pressed into a uh, rubberized, uh, it's called a, a blanket, and leaves a reverse image on the blanket as this rolls around. Uh, and then that gets pressed between the impression cylinder and the blanket cylinder as the paper feeds through from registration. And that's what leaves the layer of ink on the card. And then you do this five different times uh, for different color channels, uh, cyan, yellow, magenta, black, and there's two different layers of black, one for the art and one for the text. And so it's this whole, this whole section is just five times in a row. And then it drops it down here uh, on the delivery feed and into a pile. Um, but actually not always into a pile because there's a second step to this that we're going to get into, which is post printing diagram number two. So, uh, you have a press coat that gets put on the cards over top of the ink. Uh, and it's, it's a type of varnish that seals the card and protects it and makes them waterproof and all these sorts of things. And so it comes through here in the coder, um, and then gets guided through these dryers and then output at the end, you get the final uh, sheets, then uh, goes to cutting, which I thankfully do not have a diagram of. What I do have to show, however, uh, now printing plates for magic cards do not exist in the wild, but the next best thing that I have is a printing plate for a magic card magazine. So this is from Beckett Card Gamer, and this is the actual printing plate that was used for the black layer uh, for this magazine and you can see some of the the black ink that's been left smeared across here um, How they make these is they use a developing process to, to take the original image that's been separated into all of the different color channels And then it gets developed onto this and like I was saying um, this metallic part right here um, This is uh, is hydrophilic so there's the water, it's actually a solution called the fountain solution that has chemicals in it that helps it adhere to this. And then this darker part um, is water repellent. It's uh, hydrophobic. And so the water does not adhere to this, and, uh, but the ink does. So this whole thing goes uh, through a water mister and then, goes th and then has ink applied to it. And then this gets pressed against the press blanket. And I have a press blanket right here. So when I say it's a rubberized mat, this isn't a full size one like would be used for magic sheets, uh, but it's a grippy uh, kind of uh, tacky uh, rubber material, which you can see it gets wrapped around the cylinder 
and there's little hooks that come through these holes to hold it tight in place uh, around the cylinder. So this, um, these would be on two cylinders and they would press against each other to transfer the ink from the plate to the blanket and then from the blanket onto the sheet. Um, I hope that makes it clear enough. We can get it in the Q&A if, if not so. So now what I'd like to show, again, these aren't magic cards, but what I have here are uh, separate pieces of plates. So these are the, uh, the complete set of plates for a card from the Wizard of Oz. So that's cyan, yellow, magenta, black, and then I'm going to lay out a completed card here. So you can see in each layer, let me pick these up, and all of these, uh, it's all on uh, this, this metal. And by the way, these are only parts of the sheet. These have been cut out uh, after the print run was done. And these still have some traces of the ink on them, but you can see the cyan plate only has the part of the card that's supposed to be blue and nothing else. And then the same thing for the magenta, only has the red part uh, that needs to get laid down to make the card. And again for the yellow, and again for the black. And something you might have noticed is that um, there's a lot of overlap between the other colors and the black, and it's because uh, to really make the black stand out and pop more, they do what's called rich black, where they mix in other colors and it just makes it richer. And then here's the final card that comes from these uh, four plates at the end of the printing process. All right. So that's just a brief overview of the uh, printing process. It's an offset uh, process for, um, for printing. Uh, I'm currently going through uh, the training to be a press man. It's not something I'm ever going to do, but it's fantastically helpful in understanding magic cards. So I've got a bunch of textbooks back in the hotel room that I've been reading cover to cover. Um, the first types of misprints that happens don't actually happen during the print process, so I'll be very brief about this. But these would be layout issues, uh, where you might have something like this that happens, where you can see everything is in the wrong place. However, from the cutouts and where everything is, you can tell that it was laid out this way on the original uh, 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 on the original films uh, for when it was going to be printed and was put on the plate this way. So this type of error isn't actually a printing error because this is what the printing plates looked like. Uh, this is actually a layout error. Uh, and when they catch them, uh, they'll produce a corrected version like they did with this guy. This is a German ebony charm, I believe. And you can actually see that the, the rules text on it, even if you can't read it, is significantly different. And they printed at the bottom of this one, correct version, so that people would know which one of these is the right one. So that's more um, examples of uh, translation and layout errors and things like that that happened before proper production. Uh, another issue that's confusing is what we call um, normal print variants. So through this whole printing process, uh, there's a whole lot of, um, of moving parts, and so there's tolerances for each of these things. And things can happen where they look different, even though they're still within tolerance and so not considered a misprint. And a common example of this would be, I have two revised cards here. Now, late in the revised uh, process, a lot of people were complaining about how washed out they looked. Uh, and so some of the cards were intentionally oversaturated late in the printing. If you can see the, the color differences there, I'm trying to get less glare. Uh, but you can tell one of them is more purple, one of them is more blue. And there's a lot of difference in the saturation between these cards. Um, but that's not a misprint. That was an intentional thing that they did for this specific run. So now that we've got that out of the way for different types of misprints, uh, the next thing I'd like to talk about is stock errors. Uh, the most egregious type of stock uh, error is actually when the card is being made. Uh, excuse me, when the, when the stock for the card is being made. Stock is just a fancy word for paper. So this we have an error in the stock that has caused it to separate. So this, this card is partially split in half in the middle of the, the paper layer. 
Uh, cards for uh, the most part are three separate layers. It's two layers of paper uh, with a what we call the blue layer in between. It's a uh, laminate uh, that gives the cards its snap. It also makes them a little more opaque. It does a lot of things that I won't get into right now. Um, but here's a card that has been split on that blue layer. So the blue layer didn't uh, bind correctly. And so this card is, that's where this one is separated. And in fact, you can come across things like this, where this card came from a pack. This is the front and back half of the same card that's similar to the, that last one where it didn't, uh, didn't adhere properly. So this is an error that happens when they're making the stock initially um, uh, to go to print. Other things can happen with the stock where things will get in the way of it. Uh, so. One of the most popular ones is uh, this one. We have masking tape. Let me turn it in the light here a little bit so you can see there's actually a piece of masking tape that got left on the paper. Um, the paper is taped together in rolls initially that again uh, get split out into sheets. And this one had a bit of masking tape that got stuck on it for some reason. And it was printed over top of uh, in the printing process. So that's, uh, that's something that can happen. Here's, I have to be delicate, this is another one where there's a bit of a gum, like a resinous material uh, that was stuck on this Japanese card that then got printed over. And I'm still working on exactly what this is, but I have several cards from different points in time that have a particular type of brown staining on them. Uh, there's no brown ink, at least in Magic Card production, and because it's over a long period of time, uh, we generally believe that this is a part of the manufacturing process, some kind of ink or lubricant or something that's getting into it. We don't know if it's in the stock or the printing, but that's another uh, contamination uh, issue that, uh, that has happened. If it's all right, I'm going to do some errors that aren't allowed in the group, um, but I think that they're interesting anyways. So we have next is the split uh, foils. When they're laying uh, the foil layer on the Corona stock, um, the foil layer also comes in rolls. And when it gets laid down, there will be a space at the end of one roll and the beginning of the next ro roll where it will leave a line across the card that you can see when you turn it in the light. Uh, I believe that's how that happens. And on this one, you can actually see there's a little registration mark uh, that shows, uh, well, for alignment of the foil layer onto the card. And these, um, these are crazy common. Uh, uh, you, a lot of people don't even consider them an error, but it is an artifact from the printing process. Uh, what also happens when they're laying the foil layer down, however, uh, is that you can get things like this. This is a ripple. Uh, it's just air in there that runs through the whole card where the top uh, foil layer has a wrinkle in it that then got expressed through the whole printing process. And that can happen with various, here's just a bubble where something is in the middle of the card stock. It's gonna be really hard to see, uh, but there's plenty of examples online that you can look at right there. There's a little bubble that, that's actually in the middle of the card stock uh, because there was some contaminant um, when the stock was being put together. So that's the end of my section on stock errors. Uh, so now the next step in the process, if you recall, is registration. The sheets uh, get fed into the first step, which then has to align the sheets. So if the sheets don't align properly, what happens is that um, you'll get uh, misregistrations between the steps where things get laid down in slightly different places. So here is a misregistered card where the different layers of ink are laid down in slightly different places. Uh, some people call these uh, double prints because it causes a shadowing effect, but what's actually happened is that the different layers of ink have been laid down in slightly different places, and you can especially see on that casting cost, the two and the green mana symbol, how far shifted over those are. That's because the black layer for this card is too far to the left because of an error in registration uh, because the guides that were supposed to align the sheet didn't do a very good job. Uh, here's another striking copy of this um, where on the back of this one you can see uh, where there's white paper that's shining through in this arc right here there we go and on the other side you also get a half moon shape of ink that's overlapping on the other side and that's because 
the uh, it wasn't the sheet wasn't aligned correctly, and so didn't go through uh, each of the colors of ink with the same alignment. Oh, uh, one more great example of this is we have this with the foiling on the back of a collector's edition card. You can see the shadow over on the right of the white stock showing through. And over on the left hand side, if I can get it just right, you can see that the gold layer is overlapping far too much uh, of the ink on this side uh, because it's the whole thing was shifted over on the press. Uh, just a real quick question from chat that I think is relevant right now. Yeah. These are all your magic cards, correct? Uh, yes, so um, this is all in the production of a new book that I'm producing, um, which is gonna be a follow-up to my first one. And one of the rules for legal reasons is that it's gonna be fully illustrated and all the illustrations have to be things that are mine and not someone else's. So there can't be any claims against me. So this is all my collection. Uh, personally, I've spent many years and about $100,000 uh, amassing just this section. Awesome, great. Okay, um, so for this next part, I'm gonna talk about uh, errors in loading the stock, which is uh, very similar to registration. Um, the first one would be, and this one is subtle. Uh, if you don't know what you're looking at, we have the, the stamp on this card. It looks about normal until you realize that this is a double-faced card and this is actually the back of the card, which means that uh, for specifically the foil stamping process, this sheet went through backwards and left the stamp on the back of the card. Um, another example would be a sheet that was fed upside down uh, for just one step in the process, which would be uh, like this hollow foil error. There we go. And you can see that the stamp is in the correct place, but on the wrong side, meaning that this sheet was fed through uh, just simply upside down because it should be inverted and in down here uh, in the oval at the bottom. And then the next type would be a, a fan favorite, which would be cards that were put through, but on the wrong stock. So there's a whole run of Fallen Empires commons with the wyvern back. We have a couple of Scourge decks with the Harry Potter back. And I'm just going through a couple of these one by one because they're really rare and really interesting. Uh, and here is an Italian card from the dark that has a blank back. Now normally blank back cards are gonna be artist proofs where a certain number of uh, proofs are sent back for color correction and as gifts to the artists. But artist proofs don't exist for Italian uh, printings of the dark, uh, which means that they actually just didn't print the back of this card. Uh, in the production process, the backs of cards are printed uh, in mass before the fronts of the cards. So it doesn't happen at the same time. They actually uh, will do a, a mass run of the backs of magic cards and then store them as pallets of magic card backs with blank fronts. So uh, this particular card, um, just slip through that process without having the back printed onto it. Uh, the next issue, so this is something that's often confused with printing issues uh, because you can see that the printing is offset, excuse me, often confused with cutting issues. And you can see it looks like a regular off center except the back is correctly centered. That means that when it went through the press uh, for the back versus going through the press for the front, there were two separate alignments. So uh, I can't tell which one is correct, uh, most likely the back because it is correctly centered, but then when it went through this way, the sheet was misaligned, uh, and so you get the whole front that's um, offset versus the back. And it looks very similar to a, a cutting error that I'll get to later. And here's another example of a card uh, where this time the front of it is centered correctly but then the back of it, you can see, is quite offset. And again, that's from um, the sheet not feeding correctly one of the two times that it went through the printing process. Here's another one uh, of a incorrectly fed sheet where you have the front that looks normal and is correctly aligned, but then the back is inverted because these just got ran through uh, backwards for the, for the second printing. So that's what that looks like. All right, so that's it for um, 
sheet loading issues. Uh, I, I know I'm going a little bit uh, fast here, but I have a whole lot to get through, so uh, please forgive me. Um, I, I only have about an hour for this whole presentation. Uh, here uh, I want to get into inking errors now, and this is going to be a big section. So the simplest inking error is going to be a printer hickey. And what happens, uh, let me get a good example up here. You can see this little blob at the top of this card. And a printer hickey happens when a piece of material, foreign material, either gets on the, uh, on the printing plate or the press blanket. And in this case, this is an uh, ink absorb, uh, a particle that absorbs ink. So what you get is you get a center part that is too dense in ink, but it has a halo around it that's too light in that color ink. So this just affected the cyan layer, and you can see that, so just for that one spot on the press, there was something that, that was stuck in it that absorbed the ink for this part and gathered it all into the center and then left an area around it without any cyan ink. And so it looks yellow uh, because we're on a, a green card, which is a mixture of yellow and cyan ink. And some of these can be, uh, well, quite large and quite complex. So this is one, several copies of this exist, of an enormous printer hick hickey uh, on this, I believe this is a Betrayers of Kamigawa card, which is a lot of fun. All right, and this, these issues, um, I have an example of this. These can shift over time. So I have about 20 copies of the same card that have the same printer hickey. And let me get a few of these to line up next to each other because you can see how the hickey actually moves over time. And I just found out that these generally happen uh, in order from the worst to the least worst um, of the errors. So here we have a complex hickey on this stinkweed imp. This is a very common issue for this printing. And you can see there's these two separate blobs and what those look like. And then later in the press, you can see there's the one blob and it looks a little bit different. And you can see later on it's even smaller and looks a little different. And so these errors uh, can actually change uh, throughout the printing process and morph. Uh, and there's uh, some of them where you can trace out exactly how the error happened from beginning to end. Uh, there's also some errors where things can get in the way of the press that are a little more recognizable. Uh, so here's something, a washer or something, that got caught in the press for this Kumbaj Witches. And, and that left quite, quite a clear impression of what's going on there. And there's a whole bunch of different versions of these. A lot of them, uh, most of them are tape. And so you'll get the, these angles. Uh, where it just look it's the impression of a piece of tape so the tape isn't on there um, but it was on either the blanket uh, or the plate and then it leaves an impression that then gets passed on to the card um, in the in these different interesting patterns and here's a case where the stock actually folded over on itself and it's the stock that left a, a, a blank piece right here so in this case, uh, when the, the sheet was feeding through, the stock folded over uh, and got a hard crease in it. And so the, this part of the back of this card is somewhere else on the sheet. Um, and it completely blocked the printing process for this area. The next printing error that I want to talk about is low saturation. Uh, some people uh, can confuse these with um, things like albinos, although they're not proper albinos. So I wish I had a, a clean copy to put this up next against. Hopefully you can see how miscolored this is. All of the colors are there, but there's a specific channel that's muted. And here's another example where the cyan layer is specifically muted. It's still there, so the green part still looks green. It just looks incredibly faded. And it's not a sun bleach or any, uh, or any such. These are actually ink errors uh, where not enough of this uh, particular color um, adhered to the sheet. 
and a lot of these inking errors actually come down to the fountain solution that I mentioned earlier, where there's a chemical solution that's mostly water which runs over the plates and that has to be just the right consistency. And then the ink has to be just the right mixture and consistency to get everything to, to flow and to connect properly. And in this case, just not enough of these channels of ink adhered. Here's one that is quite light. Uh, this is also the same thing that causes um, the light borders. So you can get uh, gray borders and blue borders. And I mentioned earlier uh, that to make the black pop more, you'll have a rich black where there's multiple colors printed uh, along with the black, uh, especially in the borders, to make it stand out. If you don't have that, then you'll get gray borders like on this card. So here's a gray bordered card where the center looks normal and it's just the border. This is caused by the same thing as those uh, other undersaturated cards. And then here is a blue bordered card from Ice Age. And the black is faded so it looks blue because it has, it's that rich black where the blue was printed normally, but then the black is too light. I'm trying to get a good angle here. And it, yeah, it's a shame for that, for that crease down there. And that's, that's what causes the blue bordered cards. It, it might stand out a little bit better on this. Here, let me put a, a, a black copy of this up there. So you can see the difference with the border here and how blue that can look. There's better examples, I just don't have any. <laughs> that's true for pretty much everything in here. Uh, and here we have some different effects that can happen with the card backs. Uh, I like showing these off because everyone knows what the magic card back looks like. Not everyone knows what every card looks like. Uh, but here we have a card that is missing quite a bit of a color channel. And a separate card that's missing a different part. And even just between those two you can see the differences. And if I can slip a regular card here on top. You can see for the oval on this one how purple that is and on how light the, the text is because that's missing a fair amount of cyan. Uh, this one is missing the shadows and whatnot. This one is missing a fair amount of black. So that was, that's what that looks like on the, on the card backs. And all of this we're still in the inking process. Uh, a rather interesting thing that can happen is that when you're going through these five printing steps, each layer of ink has to be mixed to be slightly thinner than the layer before it uh, because it has to lay down wet ink on top of wet ink. And uh, in order for it to lay down properly, the ink has to be thinner or, or else it won't adhere. If the ink is too tacky, uh, then it's going to lift. And so you can have cards that have these little voided speckles on them. Let me get a good example up here. If you look at the mana symbol on this guy, you can see little speckles that are missing. And what's happened on this is that the tack of the ink is so far out of whack that there was more adherence between the black ink and the press blanket than there was between the black ink and the card. And so it lifted off and left these little speckles. And they're all over the card, but they're the easiest to see uh, up here. And here's another one that has an uneven fade right across specifically the black text layer of the card. A little bit, little bit tricky to see there. Uh, the next type, so this is something that I'm still currently working on. There's a lot of different types of voids. Uh, void is printer speak for an area of a card where ink was supposed to get laid down but didn't. So a simple void would be something like this. So here's a green card, but it has a big oval yellow area right in the middle, and all the printing looks clean. There's just no cyan ink in this area. And unfortunately, there's a lot of different things that can cause this. This could be a problem with the ink rollers. Um, sometimes the press blankets, if something gets impressed into it, it'll cause it to, to dent down and then you'll get an oval impression which doesn't lay down ink. 
And you can also get areas like this, which are faded. I believe that this is a problem with um, something else getting in there. Uh, some kind of, uh, in the press process, there's oils that are used. And on the back end of the, of the blanket cylinder, there's a process for stripping uh, extra ink off of the card to prevent it from piling up. Uh, and I think that some of that solution may get into it sometimes. Uh, only having the cards after the fact, it can be really difficult to tell. And there's another type of error you can get where it looks, if I can find an, a good example, where it will get just really muddy and ugly nasty. Here's a good one. So you can see that uh, this is similar to the other one in that we're missing the cyan but it is not clear inside. And I believe that this is because a, a solvent or an oil uh, got in the way during the cyan layer. That's conjecture. And you can see what these voids do um, to the, the color backs where we have, this one has a section which is just missing the magenta and so you can see those pips and how those are deformed. And then here's one that's missing yellow, for example. And you can see it looks purple inside because the cyan and magenta ink are there and we're just missing the yellow there right across the pips. And here is an example of pick, but from the back. And you can see there's all these little voided speckles all over this card. Now, when there's a gross issue uh, with the fountain mixture, you can get a lot of really striking effects. Here's one that's almost zebra striped with this magenta ink. And it's messing up you know, the, the borders, and it's messing up all the different all the different ink layers of this card. I cannot impress how important uh, the ink mixtures are. So the opposite of these, uh, where there's not enough ink in various ways, would be cards where there's too much ink on the card. And here's an example of that from Beta, where this card is printed much too dark. You can barely see the casting cost there. There we go. The, the lighting in here is actually quite good. This is. This is making it look less dark than it actually is. And that's due to uh, too much ink uh, you know, being on the press. Uh, either the, the viscosity of the ink is wrong. Um, again, this is something where a, a lot of things can go wrong when the ink is being mixed, when the ink is going through the rollers. Uh, a very famous example of this would be dark visions. Uh, where a large portion of the early Visions print run um, was printed with far too much black ink on it. And it's not just the black ink. I've got some examples here. Um, here's too much, here we go, too much magenta across there. That's really altered the look of the card frame. And so it can happen with any, uh, any color or any combination uh, of the layers uh, of ink. And then let me, get a, let me get a really good card back to show that off. So here's one more on one side than the other. It's just far too dark uh, with the black ink. And here's one with far too much magenta in it. So. That's how inking issues happen of that variety. You can also get um, misting, which is where uh, the plates, it's called what's blinding over time, where the different layers uh, on the printing plate, the part that is supposed to attract water and the part is, that's supposed to repel water and attract ink, those can wear down over time as the plate is used. Uh, and then they'll stop doing their job so well and they'll start allowing bleed onto that part of the plate where you're getting ink where you don't want it and you're not getting ink where you do want it. Um, there's also some things that can happen because you're producing 
10,000 plus sheets per hour on a single press and it's going so fast you can actually get uh, sprays of material with ink in it and then you get a misting error like this. It looks green, but that is cyan ink that has been misted over top of yellow to give it a green look. Or a misting of black ink across the surface of the card. You can also have various points in the process where the pure ink mixture you know, just drips down through it. And so you can get, here's an example of pure cyan ink that made it down onto the card. And it's beneath the black layer and beneath the wear coat. So we know that that had to happen during the print process. And then there's everyone's favorite, which is bleeding issues. So when the ink is laid down, if too much is laid down, it's where it's supposed to be, but there's just too much of it then it's gonna spread out and it can even smear as it continues to go through the process. And you'll get something like this, where it's just bleeding all over the place. Or, let me see if I have a good example. You can get something like this, where it's just smearing everywhere, where the ink is laid down about where it was supposed to be, but as the sheet is just traveling through the press, it's getting smeared into places it's not supposed to be because too much got laid on. Here's an example of yellow ink that just got dripped down directly onto the card as it was going through printing. <clears throat> so the next bit is something that can actually, uh, there's. A, a, a lot of different ways that this can happen also and this is ghosting uh, a lot of people erroneously call this a double print let me see if I can get this just just right here so this card in the black layer if it gives you a headache that's normal so there's the dark black ink and then there's a shadow that has the same thing uh, that's supposed to be there but lighter here's here's another example if I can get that in focus. So this isn't actually a proper double print. This, this card did not go through the press twice. Um, what happens is that uh, a small amount of ink impregnates the press blanket and gets into it. And then, uh, but that part of the blanket falls on the same uh, place on each sheet. And so it, it's not a problem for there to be ink left over on the blanket. However, if the blanket isn't tightened down enough, you know, going through the machine, it can shift slightly. Uh, and then what you'll get is a ghosted image uh, onto the card where it's the same card over top of itself. Now, the blanket is also cleaned between printings to get out that excess ink that's impregnated it. But if you don't get all of it out, then you get something like this, where you get one thing ghosted on top of another thing. Let me orient this correctly, and you can see that this is a light wheeler paladin that has ghosting from a planar cleansing there on top of it. And this is ghosting that's caused, uh, I believe, by a dirty blanket when it's going through. And it doesn't have to be other magic cards. The most famous example of this are the Peanuts medallions, which I'm not sure they're actually Peanuts. But there is some kind of cartoon character that is very lightly ghosted, if I can get this focused correctly. Yeah, you can see it a little bit right there. And there's even a little bit of text that's from a previous print run that this card went through. And then here's one that's a little bit clearer that you can see some ghosted text on it from actually a medication label. So this is from, this has been ghosted over from the label of a gout medication that's on this card upside down. All right, so that's it for inking errors. Now I've got some stamping errors to go through, uh, another step in the process. And you can have issues, um, like with the registration process earlier, where things just get laid down in the wrong place. So this has a promotional stamp on it that is simply in the wrong place and with the wrong orientation on the card because the sheet shifted as it was going through the process. 
Here's one that didn't go through the process at all. This card is supposed to have a promotional stamp and simply doesn't because it was never stamped. So there's no impression and no foil on this card. But you can also have it where it goes through the process and simply fails to lay down the ink. So here's a card where if I turn it in the light just right, you can see that there's the impression where there's supposed to be a stamp, but no, none of the material actually got laid down. And then the final one that I want to show is you can uh, have a card that's stamped so hard that you can actually read the stamp from the back if I can. Where are you? There it is. There it is. Yeah. So this got stamped way too hard, and it actually left an impression all the way through to the back of the card uh, where it's readable from the back, and that's, that's not supposed to happen either. Uh, another thing, uh, so all of these same kinds of errors can generally happen with the hollow foil stamps at the bottom. So you can have the hollow foil stamps that are offset because the sheet moved, uh, and so this is a hollow foil registration error that she didn't register properly, and so it's over a little bit. And then here's an error where it went through the printing process but didn't leave any uh, hollow foil, but you can see there's an indentation where it still got hit with the stamp. And here is one that didn't go through the process at all. There's no uh, indentation on the card, no hollow foil. So this just missed that step entirely for some reason. Uh, something that's more common but is particular to the hollow stamps is the, the bite marks or the moons or people have different names for them. And what happens with this is that the, the hollow foil that gets laid down is in long strips that advances as the, as the stamping process goes on. And if it doesn't advance properly, uh, then what you're seeing is that um, the part without hollow foil is where the stamp got taken out of for the previous card. And so you get a little sliver that's new material, but the rest of the material was already stamped on a previous card, so it's missing. And that's why it leaves the little, the little moon guys. So that's a, a brief overview of stamping cards. The next issue, which is going to be harder to show off, is going to be varnish issues. And these are the types of errors that I hypothesized for a long time. And there's some of them that are still just in the realm of conjecture. Uh, for example, we have albino cards that are missing whole layers of ink. Uh, I believe that there probably exists cards that are missing entire, um, entire layers of varnish but they've never been found that people recognize because no one's looking for it, and how would you know it if you saw it? But let me show you here is a varnish void. If I can get this in the light just right, you will see that there is, at the very top of the card, a matte effect uh, right through the M with mummy, where you can see that it's missing the varnish layer. So all of the ink is in that place, but there's a void right there where something happened, and no varnish got laid down in that spot of the card, but it did get laid down on the rest of the card. So this is something I've been playing with a lot. It's not widely known. It's not widely, you know, anything done with it yet. But there is no varnish in that spot on that card. Interestingly, I thought I had actually found a varnish albino, but it turned out to be something else much more interesting that I'll just flash by, and you can see there's some very... If I can get this, there's some very interesting things happening with the print on this card. And there is no press coat, but it's not a proper varnish void. This is something that um, was probably made in production, so the search continues. Something that's very important in the printing process is humidity, um, because humidity is going to change the texture and the viscosity and the tack of the ink, it's going to do the same thing for the press coat. So it's a real big problem if you have the humidity of your printing plant out of whack. And so I have some cards here. Let me find uh, a good example. Where these are obviously uh, ink errors. So here's a couple of them, and, and they come in different varieties. So here's a Chronicles card that's too light, a Chronicles card that's too dark, and that's nothing particularly special. Uh, we, we've, we've all seen those before.
But here's a better example of what else is going on apart from just the light, uh, excuse me, just the ink not being right. If I can get it in the light and look on the card frame, if I can get, I may have to bring in an external light source. So excuse my guerrilla photography here. Oh, perfect. Thank you so much. If I can get, there's actually, oh, here we go. Right in there, you can see that all the varnish layer is all rippled and ugly and zebra stripe. And there's uh, patches where it's missing and patches where it's too thick. And you can see it the easiest right there on the border. Thank you so much. And that's caused by the same thing that's causing the ink error on this card, which is most likely humidity, because that's going to affect all the layers of ink as well as the press coat. So that's a really good example of something else that can go wrong with the press coat. Uh, that also a lot of people don't know don't know about. So I'm that's another thing. This is was just recently discovered, so it's fun to look at. So that's varnish errors. Uh, now I can get into cutting errors. So before packaging, the cards are cut out, and again, if they're offset during this process, then you can get cards that are miscentered. They are technically miscut. We don't like calling them miscuts because we want to differentiate uh, worse miscuts that actually show other cards. But this is an off-center card that is a type of miscut. And it's the same the front and the back, unlike the earlier cards where just one side was offset, which would be a, a printing uh, error. This is a cutting error because the sheet was printed correctly but then shifted during the cutting process, um, which pushed it too far. So that would be a, a vertical example. There's also horizontal examples where they shift sideways. Uh, that, that one's not very severe, but you can see there's more of a, of a border on one side than the other. And they can just shift in any given direction and get all crazy with you. And then if it's offset far enough, you start to get where you can see another part of a card on it which is what we like to call miscuts, and it's, there you go. And the same thing you can see, also part of the card on the back. And again, that can go vertical or horizontal. And if you are very lucky, then you can get one that shows part of the sheet edge and the production information. So by looking at this, uh, I believe that means that this is a cardamundi plate. Let me get this to a better orientation here if I can. A cardamundi plate at 200 LPI. So that talks about the screen density. Basically think of it as the resolution of the printing for this. Uh, and because you're getting cards that are offset, you can get cards that um, actually connect through the offset on the print sheet. So these cards were next to each other on the print sheet, but they got cut apart because the sheet was so far offset and you can get both parts and then reassemble the sheets and do fun things like that. So that's part of, uh, I have a series on that. And then something else that's really interesting that can happen is if the sheet doesn't just cleanly slide, you know, up or down or left and right, it can actually twist and you get what we call a cocked cut. So cocked cuts are twisted in the manufacturing process. So instead of going through cleanly, um, the edges are still parallel but you can see where this twisted between um, being cut into strips because cards are, are cut into uh, their rows first before being cut into columns. Uh, and then all of that is before getting cornered. So this got uh, cut into rows correctly and then it twisted and got cut into columns at an angle. And because now this card is a slightly, oops, slightly trapezoidal shaped, you, get, you also get a deformity on the edges, excuse me, on the corners um, when it goes through the cornering process. So with cocked cuts, what you'll tend to get is where two of the opposing corners are too sharp, and then the other two corners have this swept appearance, uh, where you actually have a, a little double curve that goes through, if you can see that. Yeah, and, and the, the angles on the corners are just all wrong, and that's because it's not, um, it's going into the corner cutter at the wrong angle, uh, from being deformed during the cutting process. Another thing that can happen uh, incorrectly during cutting is you can get the wrong cornering on cards. So if they use the wrong die, 
you can get, uh, here's a revised card, but the corners on it you can see are the old alpha cut because they used the wrong cornering die on, on the press. Um, and I should have mentioned that um, they have pneumatic uh, presses that they, you know, the cards go in and then the press comes down and just cuts through all of the cards at the same time. Uh, and they just put the wrong die on the press, meaning that this one has, you know, too shallow of a cut. And the same issue going in the opposite direction is that you can have cards that don't get cut at all, either because the blade didn't advance all the way through the sheet or because you had a backing off issue or you know, a number of things that can happen. You know, maybe it was too dull. And then you get this 90 degree uh, square corner. What's more interesting is that you can get cards that where the corners are too sharp, but they're not perfectly square like I have on this card, where you can see that is way too sharp, uh, but it's not a perfect 90 degree angle. And I believe that this is, uh, there's been a few different processes for a card corner cutting through the years. Uh, and depending on, on the age of the card, uh, some of this is because the card slid during the cutting process and so it backed away uh, from one of the corners uh, or because something happened with one of the, the uh, with one of the corners of the die. Um, that part I'm a little fuzzier on. I'm still doing research into that area. Here's some other exotic cuts where I've got some cards, uh, for example, that all of the corners are perfectly square, meaning that this one you know, wasn't touched by the corner rounder at all. So that's something that can happen. And then there's even some more uh, exotic things. Uh, I wish I had a better example of this to show off, but here's a card where a little bit too much uh, stock was left when it was cut and it folded over a little bit and there's just a little sliver of stock right there on this corner that didn't properly get cut off. So there's actually some really crazy examples of this, uh, of additional stock on the card. Uh, here's one that's caused by a different issue where when the sheets are pulled through the press, it's by these little uh, mechanical grippers. And so this one, I believe, it, I mean, clearly it got crushed at some point. And so once it was crushed, it didn't go through the cutting process properly. And so you can see it has square corners on this side because of the deformity and also has, a, you know, the stock is just wrecked up here in this corner. Oh, sorry. Yes, no. There we go. Yeah, so you can have some really gnarly things that happen uh, to cards in the process. And I still don't know how this happens, but there's several examples of this one got clipped. And this is how it came out of the booster. So that one has an extra cut up there in the corner. After all the cards are separated, um, they're put into packs. And so um, the boosters, it's a flow wrap process that I could elaborate on some more. Uh, it, it seems to be getting a little bit far afield, so I'll just go into uh, crimps. Basically, there's two different types of flow wrap processes. There's the vertical and the horizontal. And depending on the way that uh, the cards are fed, they might, it's only possible to get them crimped on the bottom or on the top or very, very, very rarely on both. And there's different types of crimps based on the machine uh, that it goes through. So here's an example of a, of a crimped card. And you can see where this got caught in the flow wrap process when this was being put into a booster pack. And what it is, is there's jaws that, that clamp down on, on the booster material um, uh, to seal the pack closed and then to, to separate it. I'm going to be very gentle with this card. And if a card is so far off, you can get what's called a double crimp. So here's a card. There we go. That was so far off that it got caught between two booster packs. And you, so you can see the crimping that should have happened on the top of one pack, on the bottom of the second pack, but even with the cutting blade in the middle. The flow pack material is very thin, it's very fragile, so it cuts through quite easily. And so sometimes when they encounter a card, uh, it, it won't cut through it, and then and the blade will bounce off of the card, and then the packs don't seal properly. 
And that is what causes a double crimp. Sometimes, however, the cutter is strong enough to bisect the card. And so here is a card that got crimped. And then you can see the top crimp, the bottom crimp for the top of one booster pack, the bottom of the next. And then the cutting blade went right through the card. And so these chunks were found in two separate packs next to each other in the box. I should mention there's also some more exotic types of crimps. Uh, the main ones are going to be the wide and the narrow with uh, just depending on um, what particular crimp they're doing on the packs at that facility. Uh, here's a Japanese uh, crimp, which is a horizontal crimp, which was used with a couple promos and a couple packs. If I can get the, th there we are. And you can see instead of running vertically, the crimp across this whole card runs horizontally. And that was just uh, the crimping that was used for this particular pack. It just, it's the, the, the teeth run sideways instead of up and down is all that is. What's a little more interesting is here's a crimp. So after, I believe it's after the top and bottom of the packs are crimped, then the spine is crimped. And if a card gets caught in the spine, which is a, a little bit more rare, then you can get a card that's hanging out of the back of the pack that got caught in, this, these are called vertical crimps. And this got caught in the spine of this particular pack. And when, when it's separating the packs, uh, I'll just make a, a brief note, there's edge bite that can happen, where if you catch just the edge of a card, it'll take a little chunk out of it. There we go. So you can see that this is actually the crimping machine bit off the very corner uh, of this card just by crushing and, and pulling it through the flow wrap process. So that's an edge bite uh, that happened while the pack was being crimped for this card. Next, I want to talk about uh, machine marks a little bit. Uh, we call them in the community, we call them all roller marks, even though not all of them happen from rollers per se. Uh, and it's really hard to show what actually causes all of these different kinds of marks. Um, the most common type is crush marks. If I can get this one in the light correctly, you can see that there's, there we go. Uh, there's just a line, a straight line across the middle of the card where it got crushed during production. Um, Hypothetically, by being caught in a piece of machine and, and in some roller as it was being pulled through the process, and that just crushed this part of the card. It can also be a little bit more severe, such as in this card, where you can see it, first off, it's off center. Uh, the, the corners are deformed a little bit from how it went through the press. But if you, you can see it here, this white line running through it, whatever made this sheet go off center left a gouge that ran that digs into the stock across the entire length of this card that just uh, it, it so it didn't cut it off but it cut into the stock down the length of this card at some point in the process so that's certainly not a roller i don't know what it what it is uh, but that's another example of the same type of thing where some piece of machinery you know went over that card as it was getting pulled through the machine the next type of issue is something similar, except instead of uh, the stock being crushed or some, some such, if you recall from uh, my second diagram, uh, they go through the press coat and then they go through a drying process. But if something, you know, before the ink or the wear coat has set, uh, you can actually get some offset. Uh, here's a good example. Some, you can get these nasty marks where the ink, it looks like it hasn't set yet, and then it gets smeared in a certain direction, and all of the ink just blends together into a nasty gray across the sheet. And sometimes it's just a big blob like this where it looks like you know someone ran, ran their finger across it. Relatively sure that's not what happened. Uh, but something happened that upset it. And then there's other ones that look much more mechanical uh, like this OP card, where you can see that there's just clean little sharp lines that run down through it, and you can see the direction that they actually dragged the ink as whatever it was went across this card before it was set. And so that is uh, the end of 
what I wanted to talk about for those types of production errors. Now I want to talk about things that are questionable or that aren't production errors or people think are production errors or just uh, various things like that. Um, when the pressman uh, is getting the press ready for production, something that he has to do uh, is run through a bunch of scrap sheets. So any sheets that get taken out um, during quality control, that they'll get flagged and, and little uh, post-its put on to, or, or Sharpie marks to get pulled out of production. They set those aside and they can use them uh, for the pre-press uh, when they're getting the machine up and running. They have to run all these scrap sheets through it while they're getting their registration set. There's actually a buttload of calibration that has to happen on these presses that I'm still learning all about. So sometimes these uh, sheets that are run through when, the, when they're getting warmed up that are all jacked up will then make it through the rest of the process because they get left in the hopper um, or something happens and they get out into the wild. There's some old examples of this uh, which are from full sheets which got cut. Uh, like there's the infamous uh, Unlimited which got printed over Antiquities and then the sheet got cut. Well, that sheet was a make-ready sheet that actually got used as uh, packaging material most likely because what they used to do with their scrap sheets is they would use them to pad the pallets during shipping to Wizards of the Coast and then when they arrived from Belgium they would just throw all that junk away but some of those uh, made it out. But where you have individual cards that are factory uh, pressed um, then it, what it is is a make-ready sheet that made it through the process somehow. So a good example of this would be cards that are missing color layers it's not that the printer ran out of ink, it's that the ink hadn't advanced through the printer to the point of being printed. And that's how albinos happen. So, like I said, these will get uh, described as the printer running out of ink. That is not what happens because you would still have ink in the press blanket that would make, you know, some kind of little marks on it. But this is entirely devoid of magenta and yellow ink. And so this is a partial albino. Uh, that was most almost certainly part of a make ready and then here's a full albino just to compare it against you can see there's clearly nothing but black ink on it so this is most likely some scrap sheet that was run through the press while it was getting warmed up something else that I've discovered is it is remarkably difficult for a sheet from the end of the process to accidentally make it back to the beginning. So uh, when we talk about double prints, that's not something that's very easy to happen uh, by accident. And I'm not sure if it's ever actually happened because uh, a lot of work has to go into taking a sheet from the end to the beginning. Uh, I've been talking to uh, some pressmen and people who do this industrially. And I guess there are ways for that to happen, uh, but it's highly unlikely. And so something that's a proper double print where it's not just ghosting like I showed earlier, uh, let me get a good example of this. Here we go. So this isn't just ghosting. This is two proper inked impressions on the card. So this is most likely a make ready. Uh, regardless, it's something interesting happened because it's, it's two dark impressions that's layered one over top of the other. And we've got some of these impressions where one of them is only part of the card, which shows that you know the ink was still advancing through the process. It was still warming up. This is not that case with this card. You can see this has uh, been printed over twice. So this, that's most likely what this is. We have some that we know for a fact are make-ready sheets like this one, uh, which is uh, French over English. That got printed, so this is definitely a make-ready sheet where you have, it was a scrap sheet that got run through again and then made it out, out into the wild. I also have an example from uh, Fallen Empires, which is a common over an uncommon card. So if you can make it out, that's a Feral Zealot Deep Spawn. Homerids for the win. And then this card here is actually the same card over itself, but seven times. If I can get that a little, there we go. Uh, not all of it is clear, but under magnification, you can see this actually ran through the press seven times, uh, which is unlikely to happen by accident. So this is most likely a make-ready card. There's also some, uh, some really gross errors here that I'm still trying to sort out what happened. But here is one that has all kinds of ink nastiness happening. 
And I mentioned early that ink can pile up in a process just called piling, uh, where you get just ink crud that will build up. And that's what we have on this card here, is we have some uh, magenta ink crud that's built up. And you can see all, there's all kinds of other uh, issues happening here, but this ink is actually raised and has a tactile feel to it. There's just so much of it gunked up on the card. So this is, if it's not a make ready, it's some kind of gross error. Here's another example of a card where the back of this is, uh, you know, normal and centered, but then the front is grossly off-centered and under magnification, you can actually see that no two layers of this are registered properly. Um, it, it's, it looks blurry, but that's how the card looks. So every single layer of this is just jacked up and different from each other while, the, while all of it is shifted too far north. So that would be another example of a gross error. I don't know if it's part of a make ready, but something really fun happened with that. And then if you're very lucky, you can get cards where, which have multiple issues going on with them. Uh, here's an example of a multiple error where uh, first and most obviously the card is off center. And then if I can get this side of it uh, in the light, you can see that the black is printed too light. And we have a couple, you can see it's printed too light in the frame there. And the back of this card is centered correctly. So this is misfed with too light on the black ink. And here's an example of a card that has been, I saw a few cards from the rest of this sheet. It's absolutely gorgeous. So again, we have the front and the back are offset. And you can also see that this is fairly ghosted. So we have a doubling of the black layer on this card. To get it a little bit better centered. There we go, to, to get the full effect. So we have some ghosting on top of being miscentered. So if you're very lucky, um, you can get multiple issues with the same card. And these might also be scrap sheets, uh, but it's less likely and it's harder to prove. Um, and now we're getting right towards the end of my presentation. So we've got some cards here that I don't actually know how this happens, but I'm talking to some folks in the industry. Uh, here's a fairly common issue uh, with just a couple of cards where you get this weird... Yeah. So you, uh, if you get it just right in the light, you can see that, uh, yeah, everything is there. Like you can make out all the letters and they all have full clean stamps, but there's something funky going on here with the ink that's also going on with the foil layer. And so this is a really common uh, issue with this, but we're still not quite sure what causes it. That, that's uh, a work in progress. Another work in progress that I've been obsessing over um, are misplaced marks so here's some cards uh, here's some cards where you have a clean yellow line that goes across the top of them again this is something that was fairly common uh, for this there's a lot of these that exist but this line isn't ghosting this is full-on yellow ink clean borders on it that runs all the way across uh, the, the border and the frame and everything else on the cards. And so it really, really looks like uh, it was done on purpose. I'm sure it wasn't. Uh, but I think that this was actually a, a feature on the plate that must have just been done accidentally when the plate was being created. So that's another thing that's still being investigated. Oh, and just for funsies towards the back here, I can show some examples of uh, printed too light versus printed too dark. I should have shown this this earlier, but I, I didn't have them. I didn't have my binder situated well enough, I'm afraid. So that's an example of that. And then we can get good old Mr. Gunnarsson for the full effect with a correctly printed card sandwiched between much too light and much too dark to get those just side by side. And that's just lovely. So that's what I, what I was talking about earlier with those print errors. And now we get to the very last part of my presentation, uh, which I have dubbed the Hall of Shame. Uh, because in the misprint community, um, 
there's a lot of things that come through that aren't actually misprints. There's various problems with them. Uh, or sometimes people will even fake misprints, if you can believe it. Shameful, shameful. Um, I can say that I have been faking misprints not to fool people. Uh, in fact, I do things to make sure that they can't fool people, but I do it for research in this so that we can s spot the fakes uh, in the community. So I've got some cards here, for example, that have been intentionally bleached. So this is not an albino. This is a card that has been sun bleached. Hello? There we go. Yeah, and so you can see, uh, for all sunbleach cards, the cyan and the black are the last two colors to fade. Now, um, there was some misinformation for a while that it always faded in a certain order. However, there's a difference between uh, facilities uh, for the yellow and magenta ink. There's some cards where the yellow fades first, I can find a better example than that. Let me let me get a better one here of one that looks quite... I have some that look quite red. Here we go. So here is a card where the yellow has faded first but left behind quite a bit of the magenta ink. And here's an example where the magenta ink has faded but the yellow is still for the most part there. So the yellow and the magenta ink can fade at different rates depending um, on the facility they were printed at, uh, the time uh, frame that they were printed in. Um, the cyan and the black are always last because of the components in the ink are extremely color fast, which is a term that just means that the color is not very prone to fading. Uh, one of the tells uh, for a lot of sun faded cards, what went wrong was that they sat in a shop window for too long so you get a nice little patch here that is not faded at all. That's where the price sticker was, which blocked the sun rays while the rest of it is faded. And I always thought that that was awfully fun. The next thing in my hall of, of shame is that um, there are ways to strip the surface off of a card so that it looks like a filler or even to strip just part of a card. These are, these are not real fillers. Part of uh, these card surfaces have been stripped off to make them look like fillers. And I want to spread it, you know, wide and far that that's something that's possible. Uh, and here's another situation where you can do it with just part of the card. So here is a Uncle Istvan from the Dark that has had uh, its borders cleared. A little error here where, the, where some stock was taken off, but you can see this is a this should be a black bordered card that just the black border was stripped off of it. And it's not just with foils. Here is a non-foil uh, blanked card. And then just stepping through the process, there are fake crimps. So here is a crimped card. This is not legitimate. This is a card that has undergone a process to crimp it uh, privately. So that I just want everyone to know that that is something that is possible. Here is another card with a finer crimp on it. And uh, Fallen Empires should not have any crimps of this type. I'm not aware of any legitimate crimps for Fallen Empires that should look like that, uh, especially on an Ication Infantry. So that's something that's possible. And then the, the type of fake misprint I think most people are familiar with is going to be, here we go, the NFCs, not factory cut. So these are miscut, but it's not by the factory. Someone took a whole sheet and then just cut a chunk out of it uh, that aligns with a regular magic card. And there's a lot of different ways that these have been cut for all kinds of gnarly effects. Like here's, just extends to the edge of the sheet and just like a sideways cut on this one card. And yeah, I could go on. There, there are so many examples of that. Or even at weird angles. And these aren't always even just meant to fool people. Here's a vintage example of a card that was cut back in the day. Uh, the 1996 arena sheets 
Uh, this one was hand cut with scissors. This was a sheet that was given away as a prize. And you can see uh, they did a dirty job with the scissors. They left the corner square because this wasn't meant to fool people. They just wanted to play with the cards on the sheet that they had won. And so this is a vintage NFC card was something that happened back in the day. And for the very last page, I've got here a, this is a fake alpha cut. So here is a card that, you know, I, I believe it's a revised common, which was a sheet that was alpha cut. Uh, but these are not original alpha cuts. This was uh, done using a process after the fact. So that's something that's pro possible. Uh, here's another case. I believe I'm the only person to have actually done this. But here is a split card where I, uh, there's a process. This is the front and back of the same card that started as a regular card that underwent a process to split it uh, from the front and the back. I'm showing these off just to show this is something that's possible. Uh, so be careful out there. And here's one that I don't know what to do with yet but I only took out some of the red ink while leaving behind the magenta, cyan, and black of this particular card. So there's a lot of weird things that you can do with experimentation in making fake misprints for cards. I want everyone to be as aware as possible of something uh, like this that can happen. Um, a very recent development, uh, I was doing these experiments with cards just this past week uh, and I had set aside a bunch of just junk cards to do this on. And I have a card that had black ballpoint pen written on the back of it. And so my process left the card clean. So this underwent a process that actually didn't really uh, affect the print layers on this very much. But it stripped the black ballpoint pen right off the back of someone's, if I can get this in the light, someone's proxy preordain. I wish I had a before picture, but this was entirely unexpected. So this, you can still see the indentation from where the ballpoint pen was, but it just took that out while leaving the rest of the card relatively untouched. So that's something once I figure out the process for that a little bit better, people will be able to use to take ink off of jacked up cards, you know, because a lot of people wrote on their cards back in the day, uh, my alpha wrath of God has a little S B down in the corner from where at one of the first uh, Magic Pro events, someone had, had written that on their cards to separate their sideboard cards so they wouldn't get confused and could take them all out of their deck. Uh, but now it has ballpoint pin on it. <clears throat> and so that concludes my presentation. Um, I hope it wasn't too rushed for showing the printing process and how cards actually uh, go through from sheet to final card. And then in order... Um, all of the misprints that can happen at each of those steps. All right. So once again, that was Ryan Rooks, the author of A Collector's History of Magic the Gathering. Um, this is crazy. I mean, it's, it's, I think most of us that are in this group realize that there are a large number of different kinds of misprints. Uh, you know, maybe some of us even have an idea. I, I know there's uh, quite a few of us, my, you know, myself included, who've done some print shop work and understand that uh, there are, you know, different, how some of this stuff happens. But it's cool to have somebody who's really taken the time and gone in depth on each individual kind of misprint. Um, uh, and, and is able to, to articulate and explain how that happens. Well, thank you. What I'm absolutely uh, passionate about is preserving magic history uh, because I have a lot of documentation and things that's just otherwise lost to the world. And I want to, uh, a part of that is the printing process so that we don't lose part of magic history. It's one of the biggest games in the world. And I think it's a shame that there's already little factoids and things about the game that we've lost to history. And so I'm doing everything I can with a small group of researchers to research it and record everything that we can um, for history. All right. Thank you so much for your time. And uh, yeah, that was awesome. Thank you for having me on. Awesome, thank you.